following stories tell the tale of three terrifying camping trips that resulted tragically in murder. In August of 2015, a pair of buddies decided to go camping overnight on the banks of Bucks Lake, which is located in Northern California. The pair were 23-year-old Sheldon Stewart and 20-year-old Trevor Holminski. Despite the fact that the men were still very young, Trevor's family members, including his mother Allison, had no reason to believe that he would be in any danger. After all, he was accustomed to being out in nature and even had accomplished an incredibly difficult wilderness survival course in his late teens. This was someone who knew the woods well and could take care of himself. He even made his own film about the 98 days he spent surviving off of the land. It was called Blue Crow. He liked to get away from all of the craziness. He had social media accounts, but he never liked that everyone always had their nose in their phone. So he just liked getting away with him and his friends in the wilderness, Allison Holminski said of her son. Trevor's other passions involved writing and playing music, something he was quite good at. He was a creative individual known for his sense of humor and patriotic pride. In fact, he had also recently decided he would commit to pursuing his lifelong dream of entering the Marine Corps. He was strong, smart, and everything that the Marine Corps would be looking for. It was no surprise to anyone when he was accepted. Just before Trevor was expected to ship out, he decided it would be fun to have one last outing with his best friend Sheldon, which was what caused them to plan this camping trip. Trevor was so excited and couldn't stop talking about it. Trevor said goodbye to his parents right before he and Sheldon began the two and a half hour drive to their destination. Despite knowing how capable her son was of taking care of himself, Trevor's mom Allison found herself dealing with a deep Deep and disturbing sense of foreboding that she couldn't explain. Something deep down told her that something tragic was going to happen to her son. I had a moment of serious anxiety. I was really concerned about him and I just said, Allison, you're being ridiculous, she recalled telling herself. Unfortunately, that mother's gut feeling that Allison was experiencing was there for a reason. However, once she realized it, it was far too late for her to do anything about it. Sheldon and Trevor would indeed reach their designated campsite without any trouble, but what would occur that night was horrific and would take time for investigators to fully unpack. It began with a late night brush fire near the area where the pair had been staying. Firefighters arrived at the scene to assist and ended up seeing something they weren't expecting. Sheldon was lying on the ground, barely unconscious and covered with stab wounds around his neck. His injuries were very severe and life-threatening. As firefighters moved on throughout the area, they made yet another startling discovery. It was a body that was so bad badly burned that it was unrecognizable. It was positioned near a campfire pit and had been burned so recently that there was smoke arising from it. At this point, it was mostly only skeletal remains. The body was burned so severely that investigators knew what had happened to this individual was intentional and would have required effort. A brush fire that had gotten out of control would not have the ability to affect the remains in such a dramatic way. So who does the body found in the camp fire belonged to? Because investigators know that Sheldon was traveling with a friend, they suspect that the victim is Trevor, and that whoever attacked Sheldon was the same person that killed Trevor. However, all of this ends up changing when Sheldon, after receiving medical attention, begins to start talking about what happened. Still weak and lying in a hospital bed, Sheldon tells police that it was Trevor who attacked him with a knife before running away into the woods. He claimed to have no idea where his friend ended up. This news was of course very troubling to the police, who now believed they had an attacker on the loose, possibly capable of hurting others. It was clear to them that finding Trevor was of the utmost importance. But was Sheldon telling the truth? At this point, there's no reason for the police to think otherwise. He was well-respected, articulate, and hadn't caused any trouble before. The story he told was both shocking and disturbing. He explains that both he and Trevor took a large amount of illegal, psychogenic substances on the night everything went awry. He gives me some tabs 
a little piece of paper and we take them and we're having a really good night, Sheldon begins. He then goes on to say that Trevor became so high off of the drugs that he began to confide in him that he's actually bisexual and started to hit on him. Sheldon claimed that not only is he not interested in these advances, but he was taken off guard as he and Trevor had never been anything but two close friends hanging out. I never thought he was attracted to me. He never said anything about that to me, Sheldon explained. Sheldon claimed that as Trevor began to convince him to sleep with him, he became more and more aggressive. While Trevor allegedly claimed that it would just be a one night thing, Sheldon didn't feel comfortable. The next thing he knew, he claimed Trevor was stabbing him in the neck repeatedly. What Sheldon didn't recall was this. Oh, I don't remember all that happening. I just remember him standing over me, kicked him. And it stood up, and he realized that the knife wasn't sharp. Sheldon went on to say that he and Trevor had wrestled one another for the knife very aggressively. I knew that he was bleeding also because I knew I had stabbed him in his arm, probably at least two times, and he just left, Sheldon told the police. When police asked Sheldon if they knew where Trevor had gone, he claimed his friend had run off, leaving Sheldon primarily helpless and unconscious. In reality, it was determined that it was Trevor's body in the fire pit. He had been stabbed savagely before his body was burned in the fire pit. It had become clear that something more was going on. Slowly, Sheldon was becoming the main person of interest in Trevor's death. As they looked further into the investigation, police are beginning to doubt Sheldon's story about Trevor attacking him. In fact, they are starting to believe that Sheldon may have stabbed himself in an attempt to cover up what really happened. This was because the wounds were not very deep and were more uniform. They didn't look as if they had been sustained in a fight between two people. When confronted by the police about whether or not Sheldon stabbed himself in the neck, he denied it. But there were also cut marks along Sheldon's wrists, and there was no explanation for that. When questioned, Sheldon eventually admitted that those cuts were self-inflicted. So why did he cut himself? This was the explanation he gave to the police. Because my leg was bleeding. I thought that I was going to die out there, and I was really sad that my best friend just left me there to die. I stopped in the neck. I was screaming, and nobody came to help me. I was about to die out there. I knew that was going to make that. But investigators believe that the true reason why Sheldon may have wanted to take his own life was because he had just killed his best friend, while likely very high on illegal substances. However, when this didn't work, he decided to try and cover up what he did instead. At this point, investigators are sure that the only one in the situation who had used any sort of weapon was Sheldon, and that Trevor had never attacked him. When they confronted Sheldon about their theory, he denied both starting the fire and killing his friend. What he didn't realize at the time was that the police had a lot more evidence than they were telling him. In fact, they had found the weapon that he had used against Trevor buried at the campsite. When Sheldon began to realize how guilty he was looking, he began to switch up his story. He admitted that he had attacked his friend, but only in self-defense. He also said that because Trevor was so badly wounded, he actually asked him to put him out of his misery by killing him. Did you actually put him out of his misery? I did. What did Sheldon, not wanting to watch, had closed his eyes before stabbing his friend repeatedly until he didn't hear him moving anymore. When asked why he had then gone on to start the fire and burn Trevor's body, he responded, I don't know, I'm going to prison for life anyway, I figure. Yes, I started the fire. I was sitting next to him contemplating what happened, what I did. I started the fire. Sheldon was ultimately arrested, and while his defense team claimed that everything he had done was in self-defense, it wasn't enough to convince the jury. He was ultimately found guilty in killing his friend and was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. Even though Trevor's family is grateful that justice has been served, there is still a giant hole in their lives left behind. He didn't get to attend my wedding. Um, he won't be there for the rest of our lives. The world is not going to be the same with him. It gets easier as time goes on, not that I miss him less or think of him less, 
Maybe you're just used to the gaping hole in your heart. In an effort to honor Trevor's short but admirable life, his family plans to spread his ashes wherever they travel in the world. So far, this has included Barbados, Germany, and Austria. Steve Hagen and Jeanette Bauman met in St. Regis, Montana, before later moving to Oregon. Steve, who is 54 years old, worked as a high school counselor, while Jeanette, who is 56, worked as a teacher. In June of 2005, the pair decided to take a trip out into nature. Accompanied by Steve's beloved dog, Caesar, they drove to the Wilmette National Forest to go camping. On July 1st, just several days after the couple had left for their trip, some people visiting the area stumbled upon their campsite. They were horrified to find Steve, Jeanette, and Caesar's bodies. They had all been shot to death. The police were called and quickly arrived at the scene. They determined that two different guns had been used for these killings, one high-powered and one low-powered. They believed that their attacker was standing far away when he first shot at them and moved closer towards them before shooting them with a different gun. It was also suspected that more than one person could have been behind the attack. So what motive would anyone have to brutally kill an innocent couple and their loyal dog? Could it have been a robbery gone bad? It was determined that some of the couple's belongings were indeed missing from the campsite. This included a revolver and some fishing rods. The couple's Oregon license plate was also removed from their vehicle. Despite the fact that these items had been stolen, police don't believe the motive behind this attack was actually a robbery. Rather, they believe the couple's attackers simply enjoyed killing and wanted to take their lives. The stolen items could have been nothing more than an afterthought the individual took as a sort of trophy or souvenir. Because neither Steve or Jeanette had known enemies and were well-liked members of society, it's unlikely that the couple were targeted as an act of revenge. One theory about what could have happened is that the couple were killed by someone known as a super hunter. This is a term for a highly passionate territorial hunter who will come into a forest and essentially claim it as their own. They may be hyper obsessed and territorial over this land that if they stumble upon another being, animal or human, they will kill them simply for sport. This sort of individual would likely be highly skilled and would know how to get away with their killings. As time went on, police were able to identify one possible suspect. His name was Israel Keys, a known serial killer. While Israel's primary residence was Alaska, he would often travel great lengths to make a kill and get away with it. He killed for no reason but for the fun of it and put little thought into his killings beforehand. In fact, he would often simply happen to cross his victims and kill them then and there. While the exact number of his victims isn't known, the number is likely around 11. Unfortunately, police were never able to get to the bottom of all of Israel's horrific acts because he would ultimately take his own life after finally getting tracked down and arrested. However, police did have enough information to determine that Israel was not the one behind the killings of Steve, Jeanette, and Caesar. Today, the case is primarily cold and the pair's loved ones continue to long for justice after all these years. In July of 2015, the couple's family members recognized the 10-year mark since their unsolved death. Dan Bauman, Jeanette's son, spoke of what the anniversary meant to him. I tried to tell myself it was like every other year until it got close. It wasn't. There's somebody out there who knows something. I have a hard time understanding what that person is like, how they can live with themselves he said. Steve's daughter, Kelly Haugen, was in some ways disappointed when the police determined that Israel was not behind the killings. It would have at least given her a sense of closure. There was part of me that wanted to believe he did it, to have this big question answered, but of course there's always that side that is skeptical. I have accepted that we may never know, she said. This case is different from the rest because while it was ruled an accident, those close to the victim believe it was anything but. Let us know what you think. It all started in July of 2015 when two friends took a trip where they traveled to a wakeboarding festival called Wakefest. It was held on Center Hill Lake, two hours away from Nashville. The days would be filled with wakeboarding competitions and the nights would be filled with camping at local cabins and boats and engaging in lots of partying. This is the story of 21-year-old Lauren Agee. Lauren was 
absolutely stunning, very popular, outgoing, and intelligent. She was in her second year of college and was studying criminal justice. She had so much to live for and had even met a man she thought was meant to be with her for the rest of her life. When she approached her mother, Sherry Smith, and told her that she wanted to go to Wakefest, her mother was a little hesitant. She was even more hesitant when Lauren told her that she would be going with Hannah Palmer. Sherry didn't particularly care for Hannah because she noticed that she only ever seemed to have time for Lauren when she didn't have a boyfriend to be with. Sherry didn't like the idea of this trip, but there wasn't much she could do about it. Her daughter had already made up her mind. She hugged Lauren goodbye and urged her to be careful a sinking feeling in her stomach. When Lauren arrived at Wakefest, she was excited and ready to party. Not long after getting there, she stumbled upon a high school friend, Casey Franks. Casey recalled realizing that Lauren was pretty intoxicated at the time. She was telling people I was her sister, her twin. Lauren definitely was, I mean, alcohol was in her system, you could tell. I mean, she was having a good time, she said. Eventually, Lauren and Hannah would connect with two other people, Hannah's boyfriend, Aaron Lilly, and his friend, Chris Stout. This would be the first time that either Hannah or Lauren would meet Chris. As it gets to be very late at night, the group still hasn't gone to bed. Lauren soon learns that they won't be sleeping in a cabin or a boat like she had originally been told. Instead, they will be sleeping at Aaron's makeshift campsite located on the top of a narrow cliff. It was a dangerous area that was hard to navigate without falling. It would be especially hard to get up the cliff in the dark and even harder while intoxicated. When the group reaches the campsite, they continue to party some more. Eventually, they decided it was time for bed. Aaron and Hannah headed to the only available tent while Chris and Lauren got into a hammock together. When morning comes around, Lauren is missing from the campsite, having left her things behind. Despite her friend having vanished, Hannah doesn't seem too worried. She assumes that Lauren just went back to the bar and stayed with a different group, so she didn't report her missing. Meanwhile, Lauren's mom had been trying to get in touch with her for four hours, and she's starting to get worried. She had a feeling that something terrible had happened, and unfortunately, she was right. Lauren's body was soon discovered by some fishermen. She was floating face down in a cove. The police arrived at the scene, but don't announce that a body has been found, so as not to cause panic. While officers were working to retrieve Lauren's body, something odd happens. Aaron comes floating over in a canoe and informs the officers that he suspects that the body could belong to one of his friends. It didn't make sense that Aaron would have known that there was a body in that cove. When the police were able to get to Lauren, they recognized that she had been injured and there were red marks on her back and shoulder. There was even what appeared to be a bite mark on her chest. While police are trying to piece together what happened, Lauren's mother, Sherry, gets the worst news of her life after being contacted by an officer. He said, I just want to tell you that your daughter didn't make it, she recalled. Sherry's first instinct was to ask where the people were that her daughter had been with at the festival. She was told that the police did have all three of them and were questioning them about what may have happened. They seemed to believe that in the middle of the night, Lauren, still intoxicated, fell from the cliff and drowned in the water below. A toxology report was conducted, and indeed, it was determined that Lauren's blood level was well over the legal limit. However, they very strangely opted not to do a special kit to determine whether Lauren was taken advantage of before her death, nor did they swab her body to see if there was anyone else's fingerprints on it. They were especially quick to rule it an accidental drowning. Despite this conclusion, Lauren's parents and even some law enforcement officers believed that there was a lot more to the story. Deputy Chris Yarchuk who was one of the people who helped retrieve Lauren's body, remained certain that she did not drown. He pointed out that Lauren was found floating. I know she didn't drown. People that drown sink, he explained. To make things even stranger, when Lauren's body was examined, there was no water found in her lungs. She would have had to have been alive in order to breathe water in. This only points further to the theory that Lauren would have had to have been dead already before she ended up in the water. Deputy Yarchuk also pointed out that when Lauren was removed from the water, there was a very strange V-shaped mark on her abdomen. What could have caused it? After he looked at the canoe that had been used within Lauren's group, he recognized the same V-shape on the tip of it. It was the only thing that he could think of 
that they would have had in their possession that could have possibly caused such a unique mark. Yarchuk believes that Lauren was tugged into the canoe, her feet likely dragging behind. This would explain the red marks that were found on them. But perhaps what makes this case even more disturbing is the fact that the people whom Lauren had spent her last hours on Earth with, Hannah, Chris, and Aaron, didn't seem the least bit upset about the discovery of her body. In fact, they even stayed at the festival and continued to party. As if they could be even more brazen, following the tragic weekend that resulted in Lauren's death, Chris would go on to post a picture taken from the festival and caption it, best weekend ever. At this point, Lauren's mother, Sherry, was convinced that the last three people her daughter had been with likely played some role in her death. They certainly showed no sympathy, not even bothering to show up at Lauren's funeral. He says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your daughter didn't make it. Oh my gosh. I said to him, where are the people that she was with? As Sherry began to take a closer look at Chris and Aaron, she found out that they both had dark pasts that were linked to trouble with the law. Aaron, in particular, had physically abused his ex-girlfriend. Aaron's ex-girlfriend just so happened to be Casey Franks, Lauren's high school friend, who had also been at Wakefest. Like Lauren's mom, Casey suspected someone might have done something to Lauren and tried to cover it up. Still determined to get to the bottom of what really happened to her daughter, Sherry hired a private investigator named Sheila Waisaki and filed a $10 million wrongful death lawsuit against the three people who last saw her alive. This is based upon not only the likelihood that they had something to do with Lauren's death, but that they failed entirely to report Lauren's disappearance. While it was determined that there was not enough evidence to prove Hannah Palmer was involved, the lawsuits against Chris and Aaron are still pending. Meanwhile, Officer Yarchuk remains firm in his belief that what happened to Lauren was not accidental. There was no way that was an accident. I will go to the grave believing that girl was killed, her body was moved, and they are hiding the truth, he said.